Thank you, David, for the special music today. Friends, I invite you to a word of prayer. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, draw near to us. Open our hearts once more to your word, our minds to its comprehension, and our spirits to your leading. For you are with us this day and always. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So to partner with the first reading of Psalm 23 is another psalm. This is Psalm 90. This is often a psalm that we hear during times of funerals and loss. We'll be reading verses 1 through 6 and verse 12. So listen to God's word today. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Turn us back to dust and say, turn back you mortals. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes. And in the evening it fades and withers. So Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a wise heart. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This past Christmas, one of the gifts I received was the book called Wolf Hall by uh, the author Hilary Mantel. It's a historical fiction, a novel that celebrates the life of Thomas Cromwell, the ill-fated advisor to King Henry VIII. Now, a spoiler alert. In one of the early chapters of the book, Cromwell's wife dies suddenly from a viral plague. It's something that in England they called the contagion or the sweats. Cromwell's wife, Liz, died within the course of a single day following the grim timetable of the old rhyme, Mary at breakfast, dead at noon. See, the history of the Middle Ages is full of stories and details about pandemics and plagues. It's estimated that one-third of the Western world was killed during the time of the 14th century bubonic plague. In those years, it literally killed half of the population of Paris one-third of the population of Venice, three-fifths of the population of Florence. There are stories of people going to bed well and yet dying before they awoke the next morning, of doctors who are tending to patients at their bedside who themselves fall ill and die beside the person. In those days, the wealthy who had resources would flee the cities seeking safety in the countryside. But the poor who had no other options were forced, as is so often the case, to bear the brunt of the pandemic's brutal toll. There was one writer in Siena who wrote that no bells tolled and nobody wept, no matter what their loss, because almost everyone expected death in those days and believed it was the end of the world. When Cromwell's wife died, they hung a bunch of straw outside the front door. And that was a warning that the sweats had claimed another victim, that people should stay away from that house. It's a striking image, though, and it's one we can relate to. In these days, we spend much of our time behind locked doors. We are familiar with people living in quarantine and who avoid much contact with others, as the saying goes, like the plague. As of this point, more than 450,000 Americans have died from the COVID-19 virus. A year ago, the coronavirus seemed perhaps more theoretical than threatening. We heard reports of deaths from it. We knew of the growing numbers of infections, but that always seemed to be something that was happening over there, there in China or in Italy or perhaps in Seattle or New York. But this past fall, just a f within a few months, I would wager that all of us know someone 
who has struggled with the coronavirus, who has caught it or perhaps even died from this pandemic. It's become something very real and very personal. But this is what I find striking. We have discovered lots of ways to talk about the coronavirus. Some talk about it politically, foolishly arguing over the efficacy of wearing masks. Some talk about it in terms of disruptions, about not being able to eat in their favorite restaurants or having to cancel wedding plans and do those ceremonies by Zoom. Some have rightly named the unjust aspects of the pandemic, the excessive toll that it takes on communities of color, of women working in the jobs and the workplace, and people who have limited financial resources. But many of us have found that we talk about it in its personal toll, the lingering grief of not getting together to celebrate holidays with families, the real pain and loss of having loved ones perish and not be able to be by their side because of the virus. And yet, for all of this different talk, I've found us relatively unable to speak about the coronavirus from a faith perspective. And part of that comes from our inability to talk about human mortality in general, which is odd because all humans are mortal, and we profess faith in Jesus Christ, whose death is precisely what we remember every time we celebrate the sacrament of communion. So today, let's talk a bit about human mortality. Every human life is finite. It has a beginning and an end. As it says in Ecclesiastes 3, there's a time to be born and a time to die. We don't know the precise end date for our life, but our life does have an end time. In Psalm 90, verse 10, the poet suggests that the days of our life are 70 years, perhaps 80 years if we are strong. Now, fortunately, life expectancy rates have gotten a little better now than they used to be in 2000 BC, but the sentiment is actually still accurate. Like it says in the old hymn, Our God, Our Help in Ages Past, time like an ever-rolling stream soon bears us all away. We fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. Now, we often turn to humor to deal with the uncomfortable topic of our own mortality. We tell lots of jokes about St. Peter standing at the pearly gates. We tell about how the good news is, is that the golf courses in heaven are beautiful beyond imagining, but the bad news is that your tea time is actually tomorrow at 8.30. Lance Morrow, the author, once wrote that death is nature's way to tell us to slow down or at least not be so angry all the time. When Scripture talks about death and mortality, it tends to focus on life, but life that is brief. Isaiah chapter 40 uses the language how all people are grass. The grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. When Jesus gave his Sermon on the Mount, he talked about birds and lilies, but then he also said, Think about the grass of the field that is alive today, but tomorrow is discarded and thrown into the oven. And then he went on to ask, can you add even a single hour to your life by worrying? And then there's the famous line which I just read from Psalm 90, verse 12. O God, teach us to number our days that we may gain a wise heart. To which Martin Luther then replied, O oh Lord, may we all be such skilled mathematicians. Learning to number our days, to accept our mortality, goes against much of our core instincts. We don't like limitations. We don't like having to wait in long lines at the grocery store. We don't like giving up our car keys when we can no longer drive safely. But everyone's life has limits. Immortality, sadly, was never an option. We are born, and in time our, our bodies wear out, and we die, as is true of all things on earth. 
And that's why faith language is so important in this conversation. Faith reminds us that God is with us, right beside us, even as we grapple with the question of immortality. We don't shout our questions into an uncaring, impassive heaven, but instead, when we ponder them, when we fret over these things, we do so to a God who hears, who loves, who is near. Perhaps the most powerful and famous verse in all of Psalm 23 is verse number 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The reality of God being near to us gives us the courage to accept our mortality without being led to reject all of life because by definition we are mortal. And learning to number our days is not simply the awareness that at some point life will end, but rather it's learning to see life as this allotment of time that is full of opportunity and possibility, and it's an allotment freely given to us by a God who is beside us. So first, faith says we are mortal, yet God is with us. But secondly, faith also says we are mortal, yet God is eternal. Therefore, the canvas upon which our brief life's artwork is recorded is not a limited frame, but one that stretches from age to age. We heard Psalm 90 talk in its realistic terms about how our lives are like grass that flourishes by day and withers at night. But that same psalm chose to begin the conversation with these words, this assurance of faith. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you had even formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Mortality is not defined by the limit of death, because we are part of something bigger, longer, everlasting. We belong to God who is eternal and who is not yet done with this world, not by a long shot. So first, we are mortal, yet God is with us. Secondly, we are mortal, yet God, with whom we're in relationship, is eternal. And so third, when we remember our mortality faithfully, when we can number our days against the backdrop of a loving, eternal God, in that reflection, we gain the wisdom that is needed for a faithful life. We are mortal, but there is so much more to the story. Now, it's that message which is at the heart of the communion meal we celebrate. We typically call this meal a Last Supper because it was the last meal Jesus had with his friends. It was completed just before he was arrested and then crucified, and his earthly life came to an end. In the language of the Apostles' Creed, Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. It's a sacrament intentionally designed to remind us of human mortality, of sacrifice, grief, and loss. That is a part of this brief span of our lives. It's a sacrament about mortality, but also about so much more. Think about the words of institution that are said every time we celebrate communion. The words were given to us by the Apostle Paul long ago. They were found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now some version of that is spoken every time we celebrate communion. In that, as Paul has described, Jesus extends to us bread and says, This is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he extends the cup, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, a body cannot survive 
if it is broken and torn apart and given away to others. And blood, once it is poured out, can no longer sustain a living person. So communion is about mortality, about a life coming to an end. But it's about something more, something that is captured in the very last lines of what Paul wrote in these words of institution. When Paul said, as often as you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again in power. We name mortality without mortality being the end of the story. The one who died is also the one who rose from the grave. The one who came once is also the one who will come again. The story of Jesus' life and of our life is not a brief span of years bookended by birth and death. The story is much more. It's a story that's wrapped up in the mystery of God's love and care and the resurrection hope that extends from this point on, from everlasting to everlasting. Friends, we are mortal creatures, but we are so much more than that. We rightly grieve the 450,000 Americans that have died from COVID for the premature loss of their lives and the grieving hearts in so many families. We rightly celebrate the warp speed development of vaccines, even as we justly denounce the tortoise speed ineptitude that didn't take the virus seriously and failed to establish national measures to protect innocent lives from these needless deaths. We know, honestly, that life is short and fragile, but that doesn't fill us with apathy and despair particularly as we face injustice and racism, when we see violence against people and against the world around us. No, it energizes us instead to work for change, to do what is right right now, precisely because our days are numbered and short. And so for the work at hand, we need sustenance. We need bread and we need wine. We need a communion meal that connects us to Christ to our eternal God, and to one another. Because our story, thankfully, is far from over. So friends, remember this good news. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.